We're going to be back in the, in the book of Acts again. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3. We're going to go verses through 1 through 10 today. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. All right. Let me get to my place in my Bible. I'm trying to do that a little bit more, have it open in my Bible. All right, that's always a good thing. All right, well, this is kind of one of those um, passages that has a lot of power. Um, and it's the kind of power that, that most of us probably struggle with a little bit. Uh, we see Peter just walking down the street and heals a guy. And he just heals a guy. Like, whoa, okay, that just happened, right? And the kind of the thing that I, when I read this passage, I've read this passage over and over and over, and it's always astonished me is the boldness of which Peter was speaking, the boldness in which he walked. Now, there's a couple of things here that we'll get into to this morning, but I want you, as you read, to be thinking about, put yourself in the place of this beggar. Now, beggars back in those days... Uh, Actually, sitting on the street begging, panhandling is what's mo mo known in the modern, was not something to aspire to, unlike some young people today who seem to aspire to panhandling. I don't know what that's all about. But back then, it was only people who panhandled were people who, it was the welfare system of the time, okay? It was the only way for somebody to make a living if they were, if they had a handicap of some kind. Uh, they were, you know, couldn't work for whatever reason, or hurt their back, or, or had a missing limb. Okay, this was the only way for them to make a living. And so what they would do is they'd go to the temple, because this was a high traffic area, and they would find a spot, and then they would, they would beg for the day's money to at least get enough to buy food for the day. And the hope was that in a week you might be able to pay some rent, all right? But it wasn't a lot. Most people, it's just like today. They might empty the, you know, take the a few coins that they might have and toss it in. So let's read verses 1 through 10 in chapter 3 of Acts. And it says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they had daily or laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of of those entering the temple seeing peter and john about to go into the temple he asked to receive alms and peter directed his gaze at him and as did john and said look at us and he fixed his attention to them expecting to receive something from them but Peter said, I have no silver or in gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God, and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the gate beautiful of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, you have to understand that people who were lame, who were handicapped, or had some unfortunate thing happen to them were not allowed in the temple. It was a purity thing. It was about, it was, a, it was a thing that, you know, they would, he probably had never in his life entered the temple. With maybe a few exceptions. But he was, he was, he was considered unclean because of his handicap. Could you imagine what that would have felt like? That's, that's pretty, that's pretty rough. They could not pass, he could not pass into this part 
of the temple especially. This would have been the court of women. This was, uh, there were three levels. There were the court of Gentiles, court of women, and then the place where the sacrifices were held. And you have to understand that, uh, that he was not allowed to this portion. He, was not a, he was, had no rights to go into this portion of the temple. There's possibly some debate whether he could have gone into the court of the Gentiles or maybe to some of the outer areas of the temple. But for the most part, this was the close, as close to God as he could get as far as their understanding of the times. Think about that for a moment. He was ostracized. He was a man who probably was overlooked. And this part of the sermon, you probably are thinking, yeah, I've heard this before. Yeah. Maybe some of you know exactly what this man was, was feeling like. And what's interesting to me is how Peter and John react. First of all, he, they, he said, look at us. I want you to think, you know, when you're begging, you're not looking people in the eye. He probably was a little ashamed. This was a worker's culture. You work for what you got. We kind of identify with that, don't we, in Nebraska? We are a working culture. He, he probably felt shame for even having to ask. And yet, I, know, I think it's powerful that Peter and John, what, is, what do they say? They say, look at us. We're not going to ignore you. We're not just going to walk past you. We're going to say, look at, we're going to look you right in the eye. That, that sense of worth that he probably hadn't been feeling for a long time. There's something powerful about that. Powerful about the fact that he felt, he felt like he mattered in that moment. So, if, if Peter and John had done nothing else, that was something. Just to be recognized. But then they do something else. Faith in, in God's power in a moment can change lives. I think that we ignore that fact way too much in our lives. We live a practical atheism. You know what a practical atheism means? It means we believe in God, we have faith in God, but we don't walk like we do. Do we walk with the kind of power and fire that Peter and John showed in this moment? It's not to beat us up. It's just the question to ask us, make us evaluate ourselves. And the second question that comes to mind as I read this passage is, are we accessing that power for ourselves? This, the, what, what Peter did here, he's, where he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's not a power that's unique to him. It's not a faith that's unique to Peter. You can do and access the same power that he had. We have to understand that it's not unique. It's not special to Him. This is something that we all have access to. We all have access to the power of God. And what's interesting is, is it's not something that we get to... When you, when you study Old Test or the, uh, the, 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 the philosophies of the time, you begin to realize that there is... There was not... This was not unusual. This was not necessarily... Uh, what I mean by unusual means that, that signs and wonders were, were, were looked for at the time. I think it's interesting, in American culture, we don't even look for signs and wonders anymore. We don't even look for special things. And when we do, we look for it with such skepticism. Is it a wonder that God doesn't do them more often? I believe I've seen people healed. I know God can do it. I know He does it. But what's interesting to me is when we approach with skepticism, that's, not, that's the opposite of faith. When we approach with, with doubt, 
That's the opposite of faith. When you hear the words of Peter, you look, you look at that and you go, man, this is a man who has been with Jesus. This is a power of faith. Now, what's interesting is oftentimes when healers, there were, there were many healers out there, people who claimed that they could heal. And, and of those people, many of them would, 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 would invoke spirits sometimes. Sometimes they would, they would use spells or incantations. What's interesting about what Peter does is he just simply says, not in the power of Peter, but in the power of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth be healed. Now, we see in other parts of Acts, people try to use the name of Jesus as like you would invoke a spirit. And it didn't go so well for them. Seven sons of Sceva, you should look that up. And the power of God is something that attracts attention, doesn't it? And and, and we see this all the time. I I, uh, unfortunately have met folks that have gotten into ministry for the wrong reasons because of the fame or the power or, or the notoriety. And I can tell you right now, that's not the reason to get into it. For so many reasons. It's hard, for one. <laughs> it's a hard job. But secondly, because ultimately the power of God that we have access to as Christians is not just unique to me or to you. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have access to the power of God in your life. For physical healing, yes, but mental and spiritual healing as well. Some of us have, uh, one of the things that I've been talking to my kids about a lot here lately is stinking thinking. You ever heard that phrase, stinking thinking? Stinking thinking is what kills faith. It's that thinking that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not worth your time. You may ever felt that way? I have. I imagine that's what this uh, beggar was feeling like. Faith says, though I may not be worth it, God decides I'm worth it. There's one of my favorite songs right now. You can go on our uh, Facebook page. I posted it last week uh, called Graves to Gardens. It's one of my favorite songs right now. It's been on repeat (laughs) in my head. (laughs) Because we need to understand that God turns death to life. He He makes the lame walk. He turns depression to joy. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. He turns depression to joy. We got to make room for him. One of the things that I had a therapist tell me one time is the more we allow things like depression and anxiety and frustration and anger fill up our hearts, that's less room for God. There's less room for God. That's why forgiveness is so important in the walk of a Christian. That's why why joy is so important in the walk of a Christian. Can I get an amen this morning? These men were walking in complete lockstep with God. Sounds like an impossible task. And they weren't perfect men. I mean, we see just a few, just just before in in, uh, Luke, where Peter denied Christ not that long before this, just a few months, in fact. But we see that, like I said last week, they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can come inside of us, and He can heal. He could do things that that I can't do for you, that a counselor can't do for you. Those are, don't get me wrong, those things are good things. They're good training, and you need those things in your life sometimes. Somebody who can help pick apart the emotional minefields in our heart, but the Holy Spirit can speed that process up. He can heal you. I think it's interesting. I don't normally read from 
from my commentaries. I use them as more of a reference, right? But there was, this, there was this thing, when it comes to faith, and it comes to believing that God can do it, the Western world is one of the few places in the world that has so much skepticism that we, even when we see a true sign and wonder, we, have, we, we, we doubt it. We wonder how it can happen. And what's interesting is, is what the commentator said here. I was actually researching another part I was going to refer to here in a minute, and this stuck out to me. It says, signs were accorded high evidential value in antiquity, that the modern Western educated elite tends to denigrate them is more a commentary on our culture than on theirs. Keep reading. Most cultures in the world today, virtually all cultures not influenced by deistic rationalism or atheistic Marxism, accept verse forms of supernatural activity. Thus, those who reject miracles merely on the basis of philosophical a prioris may do so as ethnocentric dogmatists. That means, that's a big word, but essentially that means culturally they make a choice. Meaning, they would rather choose to believe in their own power than the power of God. Rather than as genuinely open-minded intellectuals. Meaning, are we willing to be open-minded enough to let God do it? Sorry I used some $60,000 words today. I apologize. But I think you're smart enough to be okay with it. It's important for us to understand that the only reason that sometimes God doesn't is because we live in a culture that says don't do it, that isn't open to it. One of the most powerful experiences of my life was ministering on an Indian reservation. Indian, I, should, I apologize, Native American. Sorry, I, grew up, I grew up right on that edge of the time between PC and non-PC stuff, okay, I apologize. But Native American culture, very spiritual people. And what was, what was powerful was we, when we went in and ministered, they sensed the power of the Holy Spirit right away. Immediately, as soon as we started ministering, I, I still remember this was not a Christian man walking up to me and going, I just sensed the sweetest spirit. He didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. He didn't know how, what it was, but he saw something powerful. That man ended up getting saved, by the way, a little time later. Hey, I'm okay with that. Say that again. woo -hoo! There's something powerful in our walk with God. When we walk without the power of God in our lives, it's like walking with, with one leg. It's not fun. Yeah, you'll get there, but it's going to be a lot harder. Yes, you'll get saved. You'll get to heaven, but good luck having fun with it. <laughs> Doing it on our own strength, why would we choose to do that? The whole purpose of salvation is so we don't have to do it in our own strength. Make it a decision is part of it, saying, God, I want you in charge of my life. I want to follow you. It's important. It's important for us to, to, to understand the power of God and let it work in our lives. To take down the walls and walk in that power. Walk, in my next point, is practical boldness. Boldness that comes from, comes from faith. Boldness that comes from faith. Holy boldness. This boldness is not arrogance or pride. It's boldness that comes from understanding that Jesus Christ is, is all-powerful. He is my God. He is the one I follow. 
It's coming from, it's, it's having full faith and confidence in His power. It's understanding that I can't do it on my own, but I can do it through, through Him who strengthens me. I can do it even though life may not be going my way. I could do it even though I, I am not enough. I could do it even though I might have denied Christ three times like Peter did. I, I may do it even though I have a, a list of failures that I can do it not because in my own strength, but in the strength of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching this morning. Can I get an amen? amen? We need to have the power of Jesus in our lives. I'll be the first, the first to admit this last year, that has been difficult. It has been hard. It has not been easy for us to, uh, to when we're alone, when we're not encouraging one another because we're not together, we weren't together as much, and we, we couldn't do some of those things to walk in that power and faith. But can I tell you my, what I feel like, what I have sensed in, in 2021 is God wants to get back to the basics, and He wants to get us back to the point where we are trusting in Him and walking in the power and the authority that we are called to. No matter what troubles you're facing, no matter what sins you've committed, there is forgiveness, there is power, and there is healing in Jesus Christ. I walk in that faith that understands that my healing comes either now or in heaven, but I will be healed, that I have something to look forward to, that I have a blessed hope in Jesus Christ. One of our favorite doctrines, and if you ever decide to become a member in our church, you will, you will go through the class where we talk about the blessed hope. Because we understand. We got to have practical boldness that comes from faith. And we don't, when we, when we preach... In, with boldness, when we speak with boldness, and I, I say we preach because even though I'm the one up here speaking, you're walking out every day. You're, you're preaching through your words, through your actions, through the light that is inside of you. I remember a time when I was uh, rock climbing. Uh, we were on like a 90, I was on like a 90 foot cliff face. Um, and I had, I had done some wall, I, had climbed, I think I climbed a, rock, uh, a climbing wall, and I've probably gotten up to about 30 feet, but this was the first time that I had ever climbed on an actual rock face, right? And I'm up there, and, and at the time, you know, I'm, 100, I'm like 130 pounds soaking wet, a lot lighter than I am now. So, um, But I'm climbing, and I'm moving, I'm on belay, and I remember... Uh, and I would not recommend this, but my pastor at the time, who was my master's commission pastor, was, was egging me, you know, giving me a hard time. And I remember, um, I remember turn, just turning around and telling him to shut up. Probably shouldn't have done that, okay? I'm not recommending you tell your leaders to shut up. Please don't tell me to shut up. That would be bad. No. Um, what I remember was in that moment... Something rose up. I'm not saying it was holy, okay? But I'm saying something rose up, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get this done, and nobody's going to stand in my way. The point of the story. It was understanding that I was, I was in a hard spot. I was 45 feet up, probably, and I still had a, probably at least another 25, 30 feet to go. The only way to finish this one was to block everything else out. And to have boldness and just say, all right, the only way I'm getting off here is up. Mike, if you're listening, I'm sorry. Mike knows who he is. I love you, Mike. All right. 
But the reality of it was that sometimes we just we decide to go backwards instead of forwards. I wonder what would happen to Peter and John is it were, if Peter, at the moment of his forgiveness, had walked away from Jesus, or had allowed, or had, or had turned and said, "You know, I'm done. I, I denied you three times already." I wonder what would have happened to this man. Probably still be begging till his death. What's interesting to me is the contrast between this man who denied Christ just a few chap, just a few, just a little while earlier in the Gospels, to Acts, where he is literally grabbing a man's hand and saying, "Rise and walk." The transformation there is the calling. Christ placed on his life to feed his sheep. I think some of us need to understand that Jesus wants to use you. He wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. But the only way that happens is by brick by brick taking down the walls that we've put up around us to the supernatural, to a relationship with Jesus allowing His power to start to transform us. That's not easy. I'll be the first to admit. We all have scars. We all have hurts. We have obstacles that, per, that, that we allow to prevent us to access that power. One, one day I'll preach the sermon of what happens, what happens when they probably entered that gate and passed that guy how many times? You ever thought about that? This was a commonly used gate. The disciples probably had gone through there how many times before and seen this man? What made that moment different? I don't know. Maybe it was just Peter and John that were different. Peter and John were different. I don't know. That'll just something to theologically short circuit your brain a little bit. But I think it's because God knew that day was coming when he would be healed and he would get to see. You know, I think there's a theological fallacy out there that says that God wants to prevent you from, from, from feeling pain. But pain by itself is not a bad thing. It's what we do with it. Pain will either make you better or bitter. It's your choice. Pain will either make you better or bitter. Peter's pain was denying Christ. He could have chosen to walk away from Christ, or he, but what did he choose to do? He chose to follow Christ even harder, even further. Go even faster towards God. And he learned that practical boldness. He learned that holy boldness. That we need to learn too. God wants to heal this morning. He wants you to receive power this morning. The power of the Holy Spirit this morning. He wants you to know Him more this morning. For some of you, I think maybe it's been a long, long year. In fact, I know, for, know some of your personal stories, and I know it's been a long year. And I can tell you that it's going to get better. You know how I know it? Because I've walked through it. I've walked through it. I get accused sometimes of being intense. And my intensity comes from walking through some situations where I needed to trust God no matter what, where I had no safety net, where I knew that the power of God was the only way I was getting through that circumstance. Now, I could blame God for for allowing me to be in that circumstance or I could praise Him for getting me out of it. There's really the only two choices. 
I don't know who that's for this morning. But whoever it's for, just know that God loves you enough to not let you stay there. Whatever circumstances brought you there, God loves you enough to not keep you there. Some old time preaching this morning. But there are some things that just never fade away. There are some things that just never die. Why? Because they're in the Bible. We need Jesus this morning. As Josh comes, we're just going to allow the music to play. And we're going to just allow... Um, you guys to come up to the altar. If you can pray by yourself, if you want prayer, I'll be up here. I just encourage you, let's seek God this morning. We need Jesus. We need His power. We need to rise and walk this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and we lay down our hearts before you. Lord, we need healing this morning. We need the power of God this morning. God, we worship you, and we just ask that the words that have gone forth will bear fruit. Lord, we worship you. We give you our strength, and we love you right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As Josh begins to play, the altars are open. Come on up. Love you. Um, all right, well, let's close in a word of prayer, um, and then we'll be dismissed. If you got something that God brought out to you, you need to talk this morning, I'm, I'm available. So. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would just be with us as we go. Let us be the light of the world. Lord, we just ask that the power of God would walk with us, that God, we would walk as Peter and John walked, in authority and power of the Holy Spirit, and God, that we would walk close to you, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you guys for coming. Be blessed.